You are now tuned in to the Addicted to Success.com podcast, where geniuses, entrepreneurs, and next level game changers share their juicy little secrets on achieving massive success. This is the advice you wish you heard years ago. Be prepared and take note as we expose the realness and the raw of what it takes to be successful on Addicted to Success.com. Now, before we get into this interview, I have an exclusive opportunity for you that I'd love to bring to your attention. And that is I have just launched a six to 12 month mastermind called the Circle of Influence, where I'll be taking you under my wing to show you how to build a platform online that generates an income for you so you can have more freedom in your life. I'm also going to show you how to become a powerful influencer online so that you can score interviews and so you can get exposure on major publications and platforms. And I'm going to even show you how to build these platforms yourself such as a website a podcast a youtube channel and at social media following so that you can get your message out there to millions i'm also going to show you how to network with other incredible leaders online so that you can interview them and so that you can collaborate with them and really show you how to refine your story so you can share it in an unforgettable way to score more interviews to score book deals and to gain more speaking opportunities so that you can become a powerhouse leader. Now, if this speaks to you, make sure you head over to imjoelbrown.com slash apply and get in before I close my doors on this live interactive exclusive opportunity where I'm going to go deep with you and with the community of Circle of Influence Game Changers. Don't miss this. Now, let's get into this interview. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Addicted to Success podcast. I'm your host, Joel Brown, and I'm here today with Charlie Hoopert, who is an incredible teacher, an incredible, inspiring individual who runs the Charisma on Command YouTube channel that has over 1.8 million subscribers. And, you know, I've followed Charlie's work for quite a while now. I love the way that Charlie really analyzes situations and breaks it down and shares with you how people are more confident, how people connect, uh, and, and how you too are able to increase your charisma. So Charlie, I'm excited for you to jump on today and instill your wisdom with the Addicted to Success audience. Welcome awesome, to- Awesome, man. Success I'm podcast. very, very happy to be here, man. Good to, good to finally connect with you. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I've been following you for years, man. And you know, I, it's always interesting. I see the breakdowns that you do on a lot of celebrities. And you know, you did a breakdown on- uh, Kevin Hart, you do one on The Rock and you do it on Jordan Peterson and a lot of uh, influential people. And, you know, my question for you would be, out of all these people that you've studied, who do you feel really embodies the, the, the charisma and the confidence at the highest level? Who really oh, stands? man. Great question. I've actually thought about this. So, I, there, there's people that have different things that I like and I'll give you, I guess, a top three. So, overall influential can change someone's life in a conversation. I have to give it to Tony Robbins. Uh, I know you mentioned you had a chance to speak to him. What I've watched of him and what I understand is that, that he can intervene in someone's life for literally 20 minutes and leave the kind of impression that affects their behavior 10 years down the line. So that's, that's incredible. And he does it at scale. Uh, for verbal articulation and an ability to make people laugh, to connect with people in a room, Russell Brand is one of the people that I most admire. He is so clever and quick uh, and I would, I would put him at least with his regard to his verbal fluency, he's like near genius level. I'm not saying that he's Einstein, but he's got his own form of genius. Uh, and then in terms of connecting with people, I just did a breakdown of Oprah. And she, I've never seen someone, it's crazy, it's a little bit before my time, but she makes all of her guests cry, like connects with them in such a way that is so deep and so profound that despite the fact that they're on camera in front of an audience, they open up to her in a way that they may never have done with anyone in their life. So those are my personal top three. Oh man, I love that. What a great breakdown. Thank you for sharing. Charlie, I believe that as an entrepreneur, you know, sometimes we step into a room and we only have literally like five seconds or a few seconds to make a great first impression. Mm -hmm. From what you've studied so far and what you understand, how do we show up in a room with a great first impression? So, I would say that the first thing that you have to do, we talk about four emotions that are going to create an amazing first impression. I think people get this 
order wrong. They worry about what to say. They worry about the specifics. And the truth is, it's much more to do with how the other person feels in that moment than with any particular thing that you're saying. The words are just tools. Uh, So the things that you would like them to feel are a sense that they're having A, fun with you. A lot of people skip this and try to impress you immediately by showing you their business card, telling you some fancy story. The second thing, that they can trust you. Some people blow over this and again, immediately try to impress you with their accolades. Third thing that you want to do is generate some form of respect. This is where sharing your story or connecting in some way, demonstrating how you're a leader, even in just the context of that conversation is important. And then the fourth thing would be reflecting now that they, th- they think very highly of you at this point, back on them, showing genuine curiosity and interest in them. So what that boils down to concretely, I would say the simplest thing that anyone can do if you want to start with fun is to be better than good the next time that you're at a networking event and somebody asks you how you're doing. A lot of people like to respond and I'm guilty of this saying, hey, what's up, man? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine too. That kind of slow start to a conversation just skips an opportunity to be fun. And if you were to be fun, instead, you might be awesome or incredible, or I'm stoked to be here, or I've heard great things about you. Whatever it is that is more enthusiastic is going to get you off on the right foot as you enter into that, that interaction. Oh, wow. Love this, man. I love it. Such a great breakdown. Uh, Charlie, I'm, I'm going to take this here because I know that we don't get to do this too often. Uh, and I know it's such a big thing for so many people, relationships, or mm-hmm. dating, right? I know that yeah. you've done some breakdowns around flirting and uh, dating. Now, I'm not, not asking, you know, how do we pick someone <laughs> up? Because <laughs> I know you're not, you know, portraying yourself as a pickup artist in any kind of way. But really, how do we leave an impression on someone in a way where, you know, you've just walked into a bar or you've, you know, seen someone across the room that you're attracted to? Uh, what advice would you give to someone to really build the confidence to be able to approach Uh, someone in an effective way to share uh, their uh, attraction with that other person. Yeah. So I think, I think that a lot of times, I guess I heard two questions. The first thing is with regard to confidence, people feel a lot of the time guilty or like they might need to disguise the fact that there is a potential for some romantic interest. And while I'm not saying that you need to start every single conversation by immediately hitting on someone, I think the general mindset that is, it's unfortunate that is, is so pervasive, at least in America. I don't know how it is. Are you Australian? Uh, yeah, I'm Australian. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So I don't know how it is in Australia, uh, but at least in America, there's a sense that if you're walking up to someone uh, that you're interested in, there's a high degree of probability that you're bothering them, that you're being uncouth or unkind by doing so. And what I would say to, to sort of improve your confidence, recognize that in demonstrating that you're at least a little bit interested in this individual, that can be quite a nice thing, even if it doesn't turn out well. So you don't need to feel uh, like like a weirdo or like you're completely out of line when you start in terms of confidence. In terms of things that I think are going to help people connect better, at a high level in any sort of interaction that's flirtatious, there's three things you want to be cognizant of. First off is, is that person finding you interesting? So again, a lot of people start conversation with these very boring questions. Where are you from? What do you do? You want to get through that and to something that is much more interesting and fun immediately. So the way that you might interact with a friend early in conversation is you might tease them. So I don't know the context that we're talking about, but if you were at a bar and you walked up to someone, you could race them in line for a drink and say, I bet you I get this bartender's attention before you. It's a silly little game, but it's more (laughs) interesting than, than starting off, you know, where are you from? What do you do? That person has heard it a million times. The second thing is to really internalize this belief that you are not madly in love with them and 100% approving of everything that they do the instant that you speak to them. I know sometimes that men and women can be caught up in a sort of starstruck stance when they, when they see someone that they really like. And if you go in instead with the mindset that I don't know anything about this person, I might like the way they look or carry themselves, but I'm genuinely interested in finding out if we are a match, that'll make it so that your communication is much more curious and trying to find out if you are a fit rather than justifying yourself and seeking their validation. Um, So that's a very important mindset to have for the second piece of interaction where a lot of men in particular will try to 
justify themselves to women. And no matter what the person that they're speaking to says, you know, I'm from Alabama, they go, oh my God, that's amazing, Alabama. And they say, yeah, I traveled to Rome. They go, Rome, wow, that's am-. like everything they've ever done is amazing. Uh, <laughs> you you want to let that mindset go. And then the third thing, coming back to that piece about confidence is that when it comes down to it, the difference between a friend and someone who is romantic is that there is some kind of physical or sexual tension. So this is uh, something that needs to be done tactfully. You need to be able to read signs and it's something you'll develop. But to start sensing how comfortable you are with physical touch and proximity. So it, don't immediately do this, but it starts with, okay, can you guys hold eye contact? If you're standing next to the bar or wherever at a networking event and you touch their arm to make a point, is that comfortable? If later on you give them a hug to say hello or goodbye, is that comfortable? Are you guys then comfortable dancing? Like just keeping in mind that that sort of touch is incredibly important to building this sense of tension and attraction. And a lot of people will cut that tension off at the knees because they go, oh gosh, I'm staring at this person's eyes too long. Like this is about to be a moment and they'll end it. It's okay for that tension to build because that is signaling to both of you that there might be something more there. Right, right. It's funny how before you were saying that some people approach it in a way where I feel like it's a desperation. Right? It's mm-hmm. like, oh, that's amazing, it's amazing. My friend actually shared with me the other day, he said that often women will ask him, what do you do? And he, he jokingly says, uh, I'm, a, I'm a garbage collector. Perfect. And he just says <laughs> yeah. nothing after that. And he said, like, it's funny because it actually builds even more curiosity. And at the same time, he's not leading with what he does because he feels like that doesn't truly define who he is. Mm-hmm. You know, and he's leading, I think, with something that is that is perhaps more indicative of who he is, which is that he's playful. Like when people yeah. say, "Where are you from? What do you do?" These are just these are these are questions to try to connect with someone. They're not literal queries for the actual information. Though later on, they might become important. If you are showing someone that you're fun and playful, that's probably more important to them, at least early in conversation, than knowing the specific town that you grew up in. So yeah, when somebody asks you for your from, I'll play around with it but like i'm a pretty white normal like california looking dude and if i say that i'm from beijing or if i say that i'm from some (laughs) far-flung place in antarctica that's going to get a puzzled look and then usually a laugh and now we're at least connecting on that level of i'm going to be joking around with you yes i love it man i love it you can bring a little bit of humor into it and show that you uh know how to have fun too i love Mm -hmm. it totally what would you say to someone that's really struggling with caring what other people think? Because I feel like this is such a big thing. There's this running story in a lot of people's minds of I'm not good enough. Yeah. So therefore, they're doing things all the time uh, to seek approval uh, from others. So what, what would your advice be around this just through what you've uh, studied and, and uh, experienced so far? Sure. I think really this is, this is when you care a lot about what other people think, I think that's the tip of the iceberg of a massive and incredibly common issue that when addressed, can transform your life in, an, in a super positive way. So leaning into that feeling, I think, is a really good one. And if you do feel it, admitting that you have that feeling is critical because once you can start to sort it out, a lot of things will fall into place. What I would suggest that this person start with is a simple question of, I care what somebody thinks, but why is it that I care who do I care, really? Is it that I care about these strangers' opinions? Is it that I care about my families? Is it my friends? And ask yourself the question, why do I seem to care more about what they think than about what I think? Because when we care more about what other people think, what we are putting second in line is self-expression, right? We're, we're worried that if we should tell the truth in a particular scenario, that it might upset the other person. Or if we were to say that we like someone, that they might not respond the way. And we're so worried that they would think negatively of us. What's really worth leaning into is how can I not necessarily denigrate that other person's opinion, but value my own experience and my own self-expression at a level that is, you know what, I still am a little bit nervous and I would like them to like me. But what is more important than that in this moment is that I pursue the thing that is going to make me the most self-expressive, the thing that's going to fulfill me, the thing that is going to give me the potential to connect with more people, even if it means that from time to time, I'm going to feel silly (laughs) doing so. 
Right. Yes. Yes. Charlie, you're an entrepreneur, right? You have a YouTube channel that is highly successful. Uh, you live a freedom lifestyle, right? Mm-hmm. And which means you're not working for a nine to five, which I, I believe is, is an amazing freedom to have. Now, what routines do you get yourself into to make sure that you stay confident, that you have that momentum with your charisma from day to day? Yeah. So I, I think I've been shifting actually a lot of my focus. So for years and years, I would say my focus was more external, uh, very much to what we've been talking about. How, how am I going to get the result in the interaction that is favorable? Uh, and actually recently, it's been much more of an internal thing. So when I was focused on uh, really developing and learning the skill of charisma so that I could teach it on a day-to-day basis, I was making sure that I was going outside and really what I would pay attention were for those moments in the day where I felt some sort of social pressure, where I maybe wanted, like I would, for instance, today, I was sitting in an Uber and I'm sitting behind this driver and I saw that he had racing stripes in the back of his head shaved in and this cool tattoo. And even in that moment, I'd had kind of a solitary morning. There was this, do I say that I like this or do I not say? And whenever I would feel that sort of social, uh, I don't know if I should, I would just do it. So whatever that is in the case, oftentimes it involves speaking up, expressing that you like something, asking a question, saying sometimes in a tactful way that you disagree with someone. That was my daily pushing my comfort zone then. Today, it's much more centered around meditation, uh, is that I do other weird like subconscious emptying things like journaling, free writing, uh, even drawing I'm doing more of these days. I'm trying to increasingly uh, get in touch with the part of myself that is not so outwardly focused and is a little bit more introverted. So that's, that's kind of how my routine has shifted over the years at least. Wow. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a huge difference between just thinking through things and actually writing it out. I was speaking Mm -hmm. with a a girl uh, yesterday who had quite a few open loops in her life. And I said to her, you know, I asked, have you written a forgiveness letter, you know, in this situation? And she's like, no, no, well, I forgive. And I I said, well, there's a difference. There really is. Because when you make that mind-body connection and you write it out, you're also relaying back to yourself as live feedback that you're committing to this new decision. Absolutely. I've been, I've been fascinated the mind body stuff. I mean, I've done, I've gone to a handful cause this is part of my job and also my interest of these conferences. And I've been going even more out there than I would have expected, but there's ones that I've been to that are about ecstatic dancing. So you can express yourself through writing. You can express yourself through dancing. And I was, I was profoundly impressed by how dramatically this style of it's called ecstatic dancing. You close your eyes, you listen to the movie, the music, you kind of let it take you the type of, effect that that has on your mindset, even for hours and hours afterwards. Um, all of these mind body things I'm getting into in a, in a much bigger way, just in my personal life. And hopefully I'll be able to talk more on the channel once I have some, some conclusions about it. <laughs> nice. They love ecstatic dance out here in Bali. So if you oh, yeah, here, they, they jam out with the ecstatic dance. <laughs> Dude, I think, I think dancing, I think singing these kinds of uh, expression that maybe are often considered feminine are so one thing that's interesting is that in a lot of cultures, and I don't know if this is true in Balinese, it sounds like it might be, they are community building activities, number one. But number two, it is an incredible way to get in touch with your genuine desire. I feel like you asked the question of building this confidence. Part of the issue is that people are so con- disconnected from what they want and so hyper-connected to how they're being perceived. And the really getting back to the, bo- the mind-body connection, that's how you get in touch it with a, in a really profound way with what it is that you desire in any given instant. And if you find that you're constantly being pushed and pulled by the winds of what other people might think about what you do, it's not so much that that's turned up too loud. It's that your own impulses have been turned down so low. So this stuff can be very, very valuable if, you're, if you find yourself hyper-concerned with what other people are thinking all the time. This is great. It, this is called meta-perception, right? I've actually never heard the term. I, I'm not familiar. Can you tell me a little bit? So meta perception is essentially this like, in a way, it's kind of like a, it's how 
you think other people see you. It's like okay. your self. Con- it's like a concept that you, that you think the public view you as. The perfect example is uh, George Costanza. Remember from Seinfeld? Mm-hmm. He's always like worrying about what everybody thinks. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like overly anxious. Yeah, have a look in a meta perception. I think you find it really interesting. I'll take a look, and and I think I think we've circled around it, but it's worth saying that this is a fundamental thing that just no matter what you're coming to Charisma on Command for, people come for dating, they come for work, they come for this, they come for that. This is oftentimes what it comes back to: is that I value the perceptions of other people over my own experience. And that's not in a moral way where I'm like really concerned if these people are doing well and if I'm being kind, it's in a, do they like me? I need validation kind of way. Wow. And this is a big conversation too, especially mm. with social media. Right? Oh man, it, crazy. That, it, I, I, I can't handle topic. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You must have a lot of people that come to you and they talk about, hey, I want to grow my following and I want to present mm. myself in this way. And Obviously, a lot of it is for significance, right? They want to stand Absolutely. out. I'm, I'm guilty as well. I, when I started, I, was, I wanted 10,000 subscribers and then I needed 100,000, then I needed a million. And, and every single milestone seems like it's so important before you get there and you can focus and it can drive and motivate you and is so completely empty. I mean, completely empty upon hitting it. And I, uh, I don't know about 10 million, haven't gotten to 10 million subscribers yet, but I suspect that it will be the same exact thing. Uh, and I, in terms of social media, I read a study that said of all the different social media platforms that are popular today, uh, Instagram is the one that creates the most sadness in its users. And so one thing that I've done that I've recommended to friends and has been very well received is limiting your Instagram use if you don't just delete it to one login per day. You, like you and I were messaging, I'll still log in for messages, but I don't scroll the news feed. I don't double tap anybody's photos. I don't check how many likes I have on any of my photos. I don't see if anybody's viewed any stories to really stop absorbing the feed because the feed creates a sense of FOMO of missing out. You're seeing other people's highlight reels and encourages you to Photoshop metaphorically and literally your own life. Uh, and it's really, it's, it's, I think of an incredibly destructive force of, for a lot of my peers. And it would be for me if I used it more often. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I had a uh, Jay Shetty. And mm-hmm. obviously you've, you've heard of Jay Shetty. Most people here have this, yeah. this guy's had billions of views online. And, you know, I had Jay in my mastermind group and it was really interesting. He said that, you know, this is someone that has so many views and so many followers and so many likes. And he said that the number one thing that he does is he does not focus on the likes. He doesn't look at that. He doesn't make that the measurement. What he focuses on is the content. And he said, that's the thing that he keeps measuring himself by is how good is my content getting? Am I getting better at expressing myself? Are people uh, engaging with the content, not through likes, but are they actually uh, sharing it and commenting and asking questions that's stimulating conversation around the topic that I speak about. And that was just so profound to me because I feel like we can measure the wrong thing so often. How many Absolutely. Do I have? Absolutely. How many do I have? Yeah. I'm, and I'm guilty of it. And certainly as a businessman, there's, there's competing interests sometimes. Cause for instance, I did a video on Logan Paul versus KSI, the boxing match, which is like, listen, that, that is a view grab. If I have ever seen one, <laughs> like I, I understood there's a lot of people interested in it. It's mildly interesting as a topic, but it's not as interesting as Oprah Winfrey, you know, who is, who is truly and deeply charismatic. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed is that the videos that that did the best view wise are not the ones that people stop me when they see me in the street and say, Hey man, this one was really impactful. It is almost always the ones where I either did it, did a, what I think is a really good job in the content or where I struggled to, to open up and tell a very personal story and some hard won wisdom of my own life and shared that with people. It's always one of those two types that seems to connect and actually impact people outside of the vanity metric of what is the number of people who just saw this. Yeah, I, I believe it. I absolutely believe it. It's funny when I post on social, uh, I do notice that when I have some really deep, profound uh, like let's say philosophical quotes or some wisdom that I'm sharing, I find that it doesn't get as many likes. Mm-hmm. Look at that. 
but I get way more messages in my inbox and I have way more comments and I have way more people joining my programs and reaching yeah. out to me and wanting one at once because they connect with it. And it's like, you know, it's sad to say that like, it'd be awesome if, if people were more into the depth uh, in society. But I think a lot of people don't go there. They don't want to go there. It's scary for them to dig deep and to mm-hmm. go to those depths. Yeah. And I, I don't know if the audience, uh, is your audience interested in, in how to balance this? Cause I don't want to talk too much about what it, you know, creating content on social media, if that's not the thing that they're most fascinated by. Uh, you know, the audience uh, of addicted to success are, they're very open to the ideas of how do I improve myself? How do I improve my mm-hmm. business? How do I improve my life? So wherever sure. you Sure. Like. Well, that, I'll, I'll keep it brief then. If you do find yourself creating content for your business, I think you got to look at at least two types of content. One is to get people in the door, eyes on you. And for me, that might be like the Logan Paul KSI breakdown. It might be taking a very popular character from a TV show and talking about them. Uh, And that's going to be the sort of thing that draws initial attention. You still want to make that content as excellent as it can be. But as we've mentioned, the real bread and butter comes in these deeper topics that people will give a chance once you've captured their attention, proven that you're not going to waste their time. Then you get the opportunity to open up and speak more about these deeper philosophical and hopefully more impactful concepts. I love that. Absolutely love it. It's kind of like the flashlight, right? It's the flash, the flashy and then the depth. Absolutely. And they're like, oh, what's this over here? And then they have a look and see that there's more depth than they, they imagine. Yeah, that's yep. Great. Charlie, you said that you share sometimes, you open up and get into the personal. Would you mind sharing something uh, on the Addicted to Success podcast that you feel would resonate on a deep level with the audience? Oh boy, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm the things that I that were at least the one that I was thinking of when I mentioned it was about a breakup. It's at this point been a year and three months. Uh, but I think a couple of things were, were impactful to my audience when they heard one is that when you see someone, anyone on social media, and especially in my position where I'm teaching people how to be happier. And I am fortunate enough that that is my experience. A lot of the time, a lot of people were surprised to see that I was upset (laughs) and in some cases devastated about this breakup. Mm -hmm. So I I think the simple fact, if there's a lesson there, uh, it was very scary to do. I think a lot of times we feel like we have to live up to an ideal of an emotional experience that we're supposed to be having, giving things that are going on. Cause I am very lucky in a lot of ways. Uh, and I felt guilty about being as sad as I was. And I didn't, I felt like I shouldn't have been as sad as I was, but I was like, all right, this is the case. And In doing that, I think it gave a lot of other people permission to be sad. And there is something cathartic, not that you need to dwell in sadness, but in knowing that you are not alone and going through a tough time, even if things appear to be good on the outside, that is, that's very important, I think, to to getting better. Uh, So that was one of it. But the breakup um, was particularly difficult because I was going through a period of jealousy afterwards and i was seeing her photos on social media (laughs) and i was tearing myself up inside and you know wondering if she was going out with this or that or how quickly she was recovering and at one point i went in and i actually went to a hypnotherapist i was like i need the heavy duty guns i've never tried this before but i want to check it out and uh, it wasn't at all what i expected but i'd mentioned this to him that this had been a trigger i saw a photo of her and he told me a story that, that I found very impactful. And he said, you know, when I broke up with my girlfriend, same sort of thing happened. She went to Hawaii and just a short time later, it wasn't, we weren't together as long, but I see this photo of her and she's standing next to this like beautiful Samoan guy with big muscles and shiny teeth. And he's just like, he's a really good looking dude. And they're in front of this beautiful backdrop in Hawaii where I'd always wanted to go. And she has the biggest smile on her face. And in that moment, I'm like, oh my God, man, that must have sucked. Like, that must have been <laughs> yeah. terrible. And he said, yeah, but very quickly after, uh, I was just so happy that she was happy. And I think when I felt that, I felt like I knew what love was. And I remember in that moment, in my very self-centered, wanting her to be sad because I was sad, uh, just misery loves company type of mood, that hit me. And realizing, and I think it's something that I still work on, that 
when you do love someone, it doesn't necessarily mean you approve of everything that you do. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you guys still have a relationship that involves spending a lot of time together. But it does mean that you are made happy and genuinely root for their well-being and for them to be as, as well off as they possibly can. And that made a huge impact on me. I think when you can do that, getting over difficult times become, becomes a lot easier because you're not rooting for the world to, to make other people's lives difficult. And I think that was, that was a pivotal moment for me, at least, in starting to feel better about what was a, a tricky breakup. Charlie, you're a legend, man. I appreciate you opening up and sharing that with us and, and getting Absolutely. involved. More. Yeah, that, that's real. That's real right there. You know, when you think about love, it's such a powerful thing that we get to experience in our life. And with so much power, you've got to, you've got to look at it like if it goes or it changes form, there's got to be the opposite of that too. <laughs> there's mm-hmm. got to be that, that hurt and that pain and that mourning of it not being there. So I, I totally get it. Uh, you know, I, I was married four years ago and four months after we got married, my ex-wife had an affair, you know, and, and very quickly our relationship fell apart. Mm. And one of the things that I, like, I mean, I'd love to share this because I think that it would relate very closely to what you might've experienced in a sense was that I held this whole identity that, you know, I have a successful business, I'm Mr. Success, I have a successful group of friends, successful lifestyle, successful relationship. Like people were coming to us for relationship advice. Yeah. You know, like let's create a relationship course. And to then like see that go, it shattered my identity. I think yeah. this conversation, Charlie, around identity is so huge right now. It's like, who am I? Mm. Why am I here? What do I have going for myself that I can create? What's my totally. thing? Right, these yeah, are really I th- questions. I think that, you know, I think it's an absolutely necessary step. It starts probably in adolescence where, where people really forge identities. I'm the goth. I like this kind of music. And it, it goes throughout our 20s and 30s or whatever, where you establish who you are. And there are things that you like, would like to be true about yourself, that you are fit, disciplined, successful. Things tend to work out. You keep your chin up in tough times, whatever. And they they aid you. That identity can be a propeller. But as I have started to focus more on this meditation, I do think there comes a time when you have to recognize that even these identities that were useful for a period of time are fundamentally, A, not true. Because every single day you transform and change and constantly have have a tremendous amount of freedom to reinvent yourself from moment to moment. But two, they become very limiting because as much as we want to experience all of these, these wonderful things of what it's like to just be the person who has it completely together all the time, that would be really great if it were the case. That's not always how life turns out. And when we deny that and when we pretend that we still have it together, even though our relationship is falling apart or that we're happy, even though we're really struggling inside, then that problem festers and it turns from something that could be handled and, and, expressed and processed to something that seeps into all aspects of our life. So now we're grouchy with our friends. We're not performing as well as work. We start to self-sabotage all because we are trying to live up to an identity that we've essentially outgrown. Mm. Yeah, there you go. You said it, the, the identity that we've essentially outgrown. That's the thing, right? Like if you're committed to this self-development as well, you're going to feel it at a faster pace. Hmm over and over again. So yeah, yeah thank so, you. Thanks I think, for sharing I think that. so. That's, that's great. Charlie, what do you believe are some things that people are doing that kill their charisma, that bring their confidence down that you see people doing? It might be like this subtle thing, but it eats away at their charisma. I think, I think one of the things that I see people do, and I, I'm thinking of the ones that I'm particularly guilty of is they give qualifiers oftentimes before they anything in their life that's important to them. So I, I would do this with singing. I did it with my writing. Before they show anybody, they feel the need to say, "Listen, it's not that good. It's not that. It's it's not developed. It's not that done. This isn't even really about your charisma. This is about your confidence." We oftentimes are afraid of being judged. So we are quick to do the judging of ourselves, so the other person doesn't have to. What the confident person does and what will make you more confident by doing it is to 
put yourself out there in your incomplete raw form without any justification and to allow people to judge you as they may, knowing that it is not reflective of your value as a human being. And that if somebody doesn't like your writing, your music, your, your approach to them in, a, in some sort of a social scenario, uh, that is not the end story of who you are. Um, I think that is a big one. Let me see if I can come up. The other one is, is again, oftentimes it's scary to be the person that is enthusiastic. It's scary to be the person that goes first. So the first person to, to crack a joke in an environment, the first person to be a little bit more vulnerable amongst a group of friends that doesn't do that. Uh, the first person to express that they have interest in something that isn't strictly in line with what you would expect out of their friend group. When you refuse to go first, you refuse to be a leader. And so by definition, you if you want to be a leader and you want to be charismatic, you're going to have to go first, which means you're, you're going to stick your neck out sometimes and you're not sure how people are going to react. That is what leaders do. And so by trying to always check the weather and see which way the wind is blowing before you commit yourself to saying how you feel, I think that's one of the big things that, that sabotages people's charisma. Um, and we can, we can go on as, as long as you want. I don't, I don't know if you yeah. want to continue. It, I mean, these are two really amazing examples. <laughs> I love that you went there. You know, I, I tell people often, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and, I, and they have this perfectionist thing quite often, um, which ultimately to me, even just through what you were saying, sounds like they're scared of being judged, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, you know, I say to them, I said that a leader isn't concerned with being perfect. The leader is more concerned with the process. Hmm. You know, like really like what is the process of this? Because if you're always going for perfect, you've got this crazy fantasy expectation and you're often going to be let down. And when you're let down, everyone else that's following you or looking for your charge are also going to be feeling the same vibe too. Yeah. And I think, and I think it's important to realize it's a bit of a cliche, but confidence does not mean that you are sure that everything you do is going to go well. Confidence means that you know that you have the internal fortitude to pick yourself back up, to understand your own value, even in the face of abject failure. And it's it really what that's what confidence is. If you think about it, it's it's easy to be confident in something that you know you're skilled in. When it, when you're we've been driving a car for 15 years and you get on the highway, it doesn't require any confidence. Really, what requires genuine confidence is doing something where failure might be the norm, like entrepreneurship, and understanding that you could screw up again and again and again, but that does not define you. Yes, that's why I love entrepreneurship. It's like <laughs> yeah, it'll teach you. You're, it'll teach you very quickly. Entrepreneurship is like a battlefield. You're on it every day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and the other thing that I will say is, uh. I, I don't know how everybody else's entrepreneurial journey will be, but I have to say mine has been, uh, there's been trials and tribulations, but it, mine hasn't felt like a battlefield. Mine has felt like the most wonderful <laughs> experience ever. Going into the office for me, that felt like a war. Like that was an <laughs> internal gut-wrenching, like I, I wake up and I put on this suit that is a costume essentially and pretend to care about something that I don't care about. <laughs> I've absolutely screwed up. I've been nervous about money, but I'll take the those trials and tribulations of entrepreneurship over what I felt was like this soul level war of of the corporate world just for me and I'm not saying this for everybody but any day of the week that that's my pick I, I love this thank you for sharing this mate what was your uh, job before you started charisma on command I was a consultant I was a consultant so I know that means a lot of things I worked in Washington DC and I basically took Microsoft Excel spreadsheets of stuff that the government was buying and tried to find where in there they were overspending. Um, and no knock on that. I, I think that there is simultaneously a lot of romanticism about entrepreneurship. And it's, it's not about it being better than having this job, but it's about it being suited to the individual. And you, you might be suited to it if you haven't already done it. If you feel fake and fraudulent as I did. This job, there was nothing, there were no jerks in the office, there was no particular problem, but acting like I cared about these things for me, it made me depressed. Um, huh. And 
And that was really the driving motivation of why I had to get out. Not because it was miserable, not because I had a bad boss. The people were actually very, very kind. Uh, but that, that was what drove me to entrepreneurship. It, it sounds like you were out of alignment uh, of your values. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I had this view of myself that as an artist, this is the self-image thing. And I had all of these, probably 50 to 100, 75% complete written blog posts that I was one day going to release when they were done. And it took probably a year and a half of like this, this job and, and every day me going, what am I doing? And feeling like very disappointed in myself and then reading a book that was called The War of Art to, to really address the fact that I was faking in my head this entire idea that I was one day going to release these blog posts was completely real or completely false. I was on a track of working in the corporate world till I was 65 and then retiring. And that if I ever wanted to, to share my art, not even to be an artist, but to, to share it and have people read it, there was never going to be a better time than, than today. Uh, and that was when I, it kind of clicked with me and I started making moves and leaving that job. Well, I'm so happy that you did because me the content you put out <laughs> is really impactful. I'm sure you are happy too. <laughs> Excellent, Charlie. Charlie, we love to make our uh, podcast episodes actionable. So do you have a couple things that you could share, some exercises or some takeaways for the listeners that they can implement in their life today? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think when people think of charisma, they often think of the CEO that they'd like to handpick them to be the next vice president. They think of the most beautiful guy or girl that they've had a crush on for the longest time. They think of these situations that are very high stakes and very high reward. And they often ask me, how do I turn my charisma on in those moments? And while we can work on things, I think the much more sustainable way is to not go, how can I be super charismatic in these high stress situations? It's to go, how can I be incredibly charismatic and self-expressive in the next interaction that I have? And the next interaction that you have is often with someone that you see all the time. And so you're kind of low energy and boring. The next interaction that you have might be with a surface person who you feel like you just, not because you're mean, but you don't really treat as a human. It's the person who gets you your food or drives you through the Uber or is just standing next to you when you're on the platform for the subway, whatever it is. And so I would, the, the most actionable thing I can tell you is think where you are, who is the next person that you are going to interact with and see if all that you can do in your interaction with them is to be better than fine, be better than good. If they don't ask you how you are, let it come through in your eyes, your smile, your enthusiasm, the tone of voice that you have. Uh, And it's not just for them. It's for you as well. So while you're sitting here listening, you can start to think about the exciting things that would happen if you did this. Isn't it nicer to walk through life feeling a little bit more animated? Doesn't mean that you have to jump up and down like Tigger, but just to allow yourself to feel positive feelings and then to express them to the person that you next see, I think that is the recipe for long-lasting charisma that really does follow you into the most stressful situations. Mm, Yes, I love this. Uh, It's like that movie, uh, We Bought a Zoo, where he says at the end, like, all you need is 30 seconds of courage. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, and the thing is, it's, it's absolutely true. It's, it's the, there's these pivotal moments in our life, and you don't know when they're coming. So start now. <laughs> like, that's, that's the best <laughs> advice I can give. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. Charlie, thank you so much for sharing these exercises, your wisdom for opening up and being vulnerable. Mate, there was so much value in this episode. I appreciate you. And for anyone that's listening, there's a ton of value in Charlie's Charisma on Command University. Uh, I purchased it myself. I'm in there. I I take the lessons. I watch the videos. Charlie is an absolute rock star teacher. And more importantly, he's digging into some angles that I feel I've never learned from anybody else before. You know, so he's got a lot of amazing things that, that will definitely help you increase your charisma. Uh, I've implemented a few things myself that I've learned from Charlie through the universe, uh, the Academy and I've implemented it into my own uh, career in the way of public speaking and stepping into to business meetings and just meeting people in the day-to-day life that I, I live. So 
you know, if you're listening right now, uh, make sure that you check this out. Make sure you go to Charlie's uh, website. And Charlie, I believe that's charismaoncommand.com, right? Yep, yep. The website is charismaoncommand.com. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're getting a lot of value out of the university. There's a link in the top that says Charisma University uh, if people want to join. And for you, I should tell you, we're actually reshooting the whole thing. So I'm, I'm taking my time because I can be slow with these things, but I'm about one third of the way done. And so it's going to be completely redone with some nice post-production and all that kind of stuff, hopefully within the next uh, two months or something like that. Oh, sweet brother. Sweet. All right. So Charlie, thanks a million for jumping on. Uh, How can people find you online uh, through your social? Are you on social media right now? Yes. Yes. So I mean, not, not tremendously actively. Um, you can, I post one photo on Instagram per month. If you want to see what that photo is, sometimes I have some music on there as well, uh, which is another hobby of mine. So that's at Charlie Hoopert. Uh, and then, but the big one where we have all of our videos is on YouTube, just charisma on command. If you search it in Google or in YouTube, it should be the first one that comes up. Excellent. Charlie. Thank you for jumping in, mate. Really appreciate you. Uh, we always end this interview with the one with this last question here, and the question is: If you were to deliver your last thirty second speech to the world, what would that last thirty seconds sound like? Oh boy, I wish I knew this was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Confidence, uh, brother. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go off the top of the dome here. Uh, tell the person or the people in your life that you love how you, how you feel about them and do it right now. Uh, that's what matters at the end. And you don't want to die or have them disappear without any chance to, to express that. So, so call your mom. <laughs> that's what I would say. 